Hey, Whitney, thanks so much for taking out the time today to chat with us. Yeah, my pleasure. This is going to be fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, like I was telling you before we started recording, I saw you back uh, in the day on or heard you on Bigger Pockets. So wanted to get you on and talk to um, my community and also the listeners about um, because I've seen you from afar and I've seen what you've done and heard what you've done and kind of wanted to have you go back over kind of, you know, relive those early investing years to where you're kind of at today. Um, so you can kind of build up the audience on how knowledgeable you are in making sure that you get some passive income throughout. doesn't matter if you're in like your corporate life and you want to do it on the side or something where you want to jump into later down the road after, um, you know, spending 10 years in corporate life. So if you could just jump into it. Yeah, definitely. Well, so right now, um, currently, I'm the director of investor education here at PassiveInvesting.com. And we specialize in private equity, multifamily, self-storage, um, hotels, car washes, and um, first position uh, real estate debt. Um, you know, really stabilize the assets that can help produce cash flow, equity growth, tax benefits, and diversification for you know passive investors, especially if your higher invest use is in your time, or maybe you're a tired landlord, um, or a higher invest use is in your job. You know, maybe like a doctor, lawyer, engineer, tech worker. Um, and so that's really what I get to do. I get to just educate people on ins and outs of passive investing. As, you know, since uh, having raised on over 20 deals myself, but also, um, you know, as a passive investor in over 50 deals, you know, I can speak from both sides of it. Um, but that's not where I started out. I don't have a real estate degree. I didn't I didn't come out of the womb like in, in a real estate family. I actually um, was in public health. And back in 2002, I bought a house with a significant other and the relationship fell apart. Um, and I had a house and all the bills and it was scary. It was scary times. I was in my, you know, early twenties when this happened. And so I, what do you do? I stuffed the house full of roommates that didn't mind living in a construction zone. Um, YouTube didn't exist. So I got the home Depot one, two, three book and, uh, did the rehab largely myself. I'm like, I'm a smart girl. I can figure this out. <laughs> you know, my, my dad had taught me, you know, he was a, you know, um, his, one of his hobbies was woodworking. So I was used to power tools, very large ones at that. I'm like, I can figure this out. It's not that big deal. People used to build their houses. Right. Um, I did a lot of things right and a lot of things wrong. Um, but you know, about 11 minutes later, I panicked and sold the house. I, my whole vision was sell this house, get out from underneath it. But when I sold the house, that was the slap in the forehead. And I'm like, man, I made more in my day in, in, with this house remodel than I did at my day job that had me traveling 80 hours a week. Um, I actually hadn't, because I was house hacking, I had roommates. I hadn't been paying for any of the utilities or the mortgage or anything like that. I'm like, whoa, hold on. Maybe I made a mistake by selling that house. Okay, I'll go do this again. And so I did a few more projects, some went well, especially well, um, <laughs> others not so well. Um, and anyways, long story short, um, you know, I my husband joined me very quickly um, in this process and we did a few projects together. We're actually living in our last live-in flip. It's a, a 10 year flip. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, and, but we had, we found we were doing really well building up buckets of equity, but we couldn't figure out how people retired off of this. It wasn't yeah. passive income. I was like, all we have is another job. I'm like, then somebody said, why don't you keep one of your flips? I'm like, oh, brilliant. Keep it, put tenants in that. <laughs> like, you know, don't have to try that out for me. Yeah. Um, so I, we scaled up a portfolio of over 30 single family rentals. Once we figured out how to analyze everything correctly, now, mm. that, that took a house and a half to figure out how to analyze things correctly. Yeah. And, and then we hit our next level of achievement, which was um, we were doing well, still at building equity, getting some cash flow in the belt, but it was just very time intensive still. It was leverage, it was passive. We had everything with property management, but I, had, I was taking care of three family members. I had a little child at home. We were both working full time, you know, securing all the loans, making all the decisions across 30 single family properties. I'm like, there's got to be something more passive than this. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, we were still, we knew we were going to have our, uh, our active projects. We knew we were still cont going to continue to, to do flips and um, do burr investments and stuff like that. We knew we'd still do that, but I'm like, I can't see myself owning 80 single family properties. Um, I just, the, it just, sh I shuddered thinking that or a hundred, uh, you know, over a hundred or a thousand. Um, so at the same time, it had actually started investing my IRA in sing, um, multifamily real estate passively in private equity deals. Cool. And I kind of thought it was like a, a bond or something like that. And I just kind of like set it, forget it. I'm not going to look at it. And then I was like, wait a second, hold on. I might be onto something here. And um, that was like, that's true mailbox money. Yes, I have a lower return. I, I could do it myself and make a higher return. But at the same time, there's I have to calculate in my return on my time. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, my, when I started calculating my return on my time, I was like, wait a second. There's just nothing that compares. Yeah. Um, so we have a mixed portfolio now. We still have single family rentals. We um, just a handful of them left now. We have some midterm rentals, short term rentals. Uh, we have a camper van business. That's fun. Uh, okay. and, then, uh, and then, which is another just kind of short-term rental, but on wheels. And then, um, you know, we have our passive investing deals. And so, I mean, I guess I left out a little chapter of the story there is when we were looking to scale, um, do we do it actively or do we do it passively? And yeah. I, was like, I have to learn both sides of the business if I'm going to do this really well. So I thought. And so I actually got, you know, um, was a general partner on 10 assets. And I was like, wait a second, do I have to be an active partner in this? And I'm like, I mean, if you want the really large checks, sure, maybe. But I was like, for where I am in my life right now, mm -hmm. uh, wanting, wanting to focus on family, focus on travel. Uh, I was like, you know, I'm doing, we're doing very well with our 6,500 residential units in partnership and 2,200 self-storage and seven car washes. So, and then in part yeah. in the pear tree, we got a bunch of other stuff too. Well, that was a, a lot to unpack in um, mm -hmm. just a short amount of time. So I would like to go back, just kind of switching, you know, gears where you said you had 30 deals on your belt, single families, and then you guys said, okay, well, you know, uh, we need to, you know, change because it seems like it's going to be overwhelming and or, you know, I don't foresee the future of scaling, you know, three to four X of what we have now. Um, why did you guys do that? Because I've heard, you know, some people would love just 30 rentals and then some would want 50 to 100 and do it all on their own. Right. Um, but why did you guys make that shift? So it was twofold. Um, initially with the 30 single family rentals that, um, it, and I've always been one to kind of fear set, if you will, like the financials really on the single family properties. Um, so I underwrite very conservatively, you know, we have the cash flow coming in, I'm setting aside heavy reserves because you never know, you know what the tenant's going to do, <laughs> you know, and on single family properties, you're hundred percent occupied or you're losing money. It's not that you're 100% vacant. You are, but you're either making money or you're losing money. It doesn't like there isn't there is no net zero. Yeah. And anyways, so once I was in the business for a while, I'm like, oh, I got to scale further in order to stabilize this income. And um, but I had enough coming in that I could step away from my day job. I felt very comfortable with that. And initially. Um, part of the story I left out, um, when I started, you know, really focusing on rentals, my husband was like, you go do you like, I, I've got a day job, we have our family, I really want to have like some, you know, R and R time, you know, and here I am, he's watching football. And I'm like, you know, pounding away going, honey, look at this house, look at that house. And he's like, Oh, God. Um, but he really 110% supported what I was doing. And so I was like, well, I'm gonna build up this cash flow for myself, I'm gonna exit first. And once he saw this and the freedom that came along with that, I told him, I showed him the, the financials. I'm like, I'm able to leave my job. Are you okay if I reduce my time? He brought this little baby at home. I really want to be with her more. And he goes, I want, that's amazing. And I'd like that too. And I went, yeah. we did not underwrite for that. <laughs> I was like, oh boy, redo everything. Quick math in my head. I'm like, uh, we go, I have to go from 30 to 80, maybe. Could we grow it as much as we wanted to? 
uh, could we find a property manager that we could put 80 single family properties with? By that time, for some of our properties, we'd already switched property managers twice. Mm -hmm. I was like, we still were going to be incredibly active yeah. in that business more so than we really truly wanted to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, well, going back to the property manager, key pieces, you know, finding a manager that's going to be able to, you know, house all those because you'd want at least one or two to be able to do all that. And, that, you know, sometimes when you look at property managers, um, they have maybe a hundred, 200, you know, doors that they're, you know, managing. So adding almost double what they have now would be great for them because all of a sudden they're saying, okay, well, we're going to add double the business, but do we have the scalability and also the people to do that? And I feel like property managers, um, unless they're very, very big and they're very expensive, um, look at it as like, okay, well, I'll keep, I'll slowly scale, you know, over the course of 20, 30 years versus scaling up big and getting, you know, multiple, you know, people involved in multiple houses. So that that's a hard piece to, I would say to swallow for you guys. And I could see how you guys deviated from that for sure. And had issues finding, um, you know, property managers. So, um, so when you guys, okay, so 30 deals and then you said, okay, from here, we didn't have the, you know, we didn't have all the bandwidth and or, you know, capacity to do this. What'd you guys do then? Well, so I had those, you know, two private placement, um, assets in my self-directed IRA. And so that was tangent number one. Like we could just do this passively, but yeah. I, I felt like we still needed to have some sort of active involvement in order to kind of get those larger paychecks coming in to where we could shuttle it over there to the passive investing. So I was like, well, let's learn the industry. You know, we have these skills in building up a single family, you know, rental portfolio. I can qualify for lending for on a multifamily building, maybe like a 40, 50 unit building. Mm -hmm. Let's go. You know, it can't be that hard <laughs> to get yeah. a building. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, it turned out to be a little bit harder. Um, our first deal was a JV deal on a 52 unit building. And, um, you know, we ran into management problems again. You know, uh, we switched the leasing agent twice. And the second time, the leasing agent actually committed, I mean, in short, fraud. They wanted the, uh, their yearly bonus and were just essentially forging leases um, to get their year-end bonus. Nice. And I'm like, how did, why would you do that? Like, now you don't have a job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so now we're behind the eight ball on that. Um, but, it, I mean, I learned a lot in that process. And then um, I also had the pleasure of working, um, you know, with a private equity group and help, you know, a new private equity group and really helping them scale their portfolio on larger multifamily assets. But it was kind of an incremental steps. So we were doing passive and then also the active strategy. Mm -hmm. And really, we found that we what worked really well for us were to use our our single family and small multifamily portfolio has like a little ATM to continue to feed the passive investments gotcha. all the while building the network and the skills, um, to, you know, go buy our own building if we wanted to at some point in time. Yeah. 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 Um, when you guys were switching gears, the networking to get there, um, how, how did that go? Because first you're doing single family, right? And that's, that's fairly easy. I can go, you know, on the MLS outside of being an agent and just, a uh, a person without a license. So you can go just have an agent send you listings, or you can go on Zillow, truly a Renfin realtor.com. But it's different when you change from that to going to scaling to, to different properties, one and two multifamily, you know, mobile home parks, uh, car washes, all those other things. So tell me how you guys switched mindset towards doing that versus doing single family on, on the actual networking side of it. Well, it was, you know, when you hit a level of achievement, and this is a you know, quote by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan, like you have, you, you're lacking a person or a process. Mm -hmm. So we had, translatable skills, right? Um, what we didn't have was the network. And I think that's where we really had to, instead of relying on ourselves and maybe one or two other people to help bring us deals, to help fill our deal portfolio, we really had to step. And when I say we, me, I was the one largely hand, um, handling this um, side of the business uh, on networking and finding partners that had those connections. Cause I didn't, I didn't, what were my skills? What are the skills that I could bring to the partnership? That's what I had to focus on. And then 
I needed to go find that person or process that could help me achieve my goals that had that network, those, the, the, those relationships already in place. Most people probably would try to go figure it out themselves and get entirely overwhelmed. Um, one of the books I love um, that I read during this time, trying to figure out, I'm like, oh, I can start my own syndication business, no big deal. I read the book, um, Best Ever Apartment Syndication by Joe Fairless, and I got to the mm -hmm. end, and I still recommend this for limited partners to read as well. I'm like, one, you get really good. You learn the business. You learn who all the players are. You learn the questions to ask. You learn how to underwrite. And then at the state, same time, it might scare the pants off of you <laughs> to yeah. see all these moving parts. And you're like, yeah, no way. Um, and, and there's an exit for that person who says, no way. Like, go invest in somebody else's business that's doing yeah. this, that has those puzzle pieces solved. Um, you know, it's, you're just taking on a different role. For me, like, I, I really wanted to, to experience that. And I thought, I mean, you, you don't go in to kind of test the waters and dip your toe. You go in because you want to do it. And I thought I really, really wanted to do it. And I did. Um, and I did it. And I'm, you know, taking kind of a step back, you know, where I'm at with my family right now to kind of like take a breather, kind of coming out of this COVID time. My daughter, she's 10 going on 11. She still likes me. <laughs> There'll be a time that I can step back in more, more yeah. in a higher level capacity. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, when your kids, you know, that six to 13 range, you have a different um, mindset comparatively to, you know, when they're older and or younger, um, depending on also what what capacity you are in their life as well, if you're, you know, the breadwinner or vice versa. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, for one, networking for two, reading and educating along the way, especially leveling up is huge to me to make sure that you can analyze deals and or at least speak the language when you're having those conversations with the people that you want to get in front of. Um, and then, you know, I would say mindset shift is, you know, one thing that I I foresee, especially with you guys going from point A to point, you know, B on single family to multifamily and or, you know, bigger investing. So um, was there anything that you guys, you know, changed outside of, you know, making sure you're networked and or educated yourself along those lines, like mindset wise, like, okay, well, hey, what else can we do to make sure that we're looking at these properties and or capable of it, right? You kind of talked about um, those people that say that, no, I, I don't want to do that or that's too much. Um, they can, you know, basically invest passively. But what do you guys switch outside of that? Well, I think you already touched on it. It's the mind skill, mindset skills and networks, right? So for one, the mindset is, um, you know, you know, real estate is a relationship business. Like we had to, you know, really kind of step outside of ourselves to understand that we needed other people and we needed a, a plethora of other people in order to achieve what we wanted to achieve. You know, skill wise, um, you know, we had this, we had, like I said, we had translatable skills. I think one thing that we had to change there is the speed at which we were underwriting and the volume of which we were underwriting. Now, I would sometimes, you know, analyze 30 single family properties in a week, but putting together a single family property analysis versus a multifamily deal analysis, um, two entirely different beasts. You know, one might take you like 15 minutes to get to a high level, yes. The other one might take you like an hour or two hours to get to a high level, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's not even due diligence, right? Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's not that it's, horribly different you just you know you just have to be able to underwrite faster and more to more detail and so we had to completely change our underwriting model we had to be able to implement a, a model that was quick and scalable and that we could outsource this we, we had to tap into it no longer was i doing all the underwriting i had to put in a process hand it over to virtual assistants set up all of our search criteria and then you know i was you know, elevating myself, you know, from the day-to-day -day operator to like kind of more of a COO role, like mm -hmm. overseeing the work or a director role, like overseeing all the work and, and then making decisions on, you know, on that work that somebody else was doing. And, you know, that, that's a, that's a skill. I'm not saying that single family investors don't have it. Many, I would imagine do, um, especially if they're professionals, 
But you know, to do that in your day-to-day -day job and then turn around and have to do that at home when you're building your portfolio, you know, that's something that most people wouldn't choose to do. Um, and then, you know, again, the networks, you know, I, I, you know, for single family investing, I really, I just had to know my realtor and my farm markets, maybe yeah. talk to some lenders, go to a meetup every now and then maybe listen to some podcasts, but you get in the multifamily space. I needed to know who's who I needed partners. So I ended up, you know, started traveling more, going to conferences. So we really had to kind of step up all levels of the game. Yeah. I mean, your education just off um, the basis of going from, you know, one level to the next is, you know, conferences too. You know, there's a lot of people that that don't want to commit more money to education, especially after, you know, a college degree. Um, but in reality, you know, a lot of people that are, are very successful just in, you know, the investing space and or real estate space um, put a lot of emphasis and time on education throughout the year um, by maybe reading books and or going to conferences and, you know, outside of networking with those specific people, just getting more knowledge of what's coming up in the next years and or what's going on right now. Um, I think real estate has a stigma that, you know, is is more old school mindset. And I think people like you being able to be, you know, looking forward for the next adventure and or the next um, process to make sure that it's more simplified for the people that you hire it are people that win and all, also are successful. So, um, I commend you, especially, you know, thinking outside the box of 30 rental units and then moving forward and doing, you know, what you've done thus far, getting to, uh, VAs to hire VAs. What was that process like? Cause I know a lot of people use them. I use them, but what's your process on finding them, vetting them and making sure that they actually are good for your system? Well, I have, I have to admit, I kind of got a little lucky off the very beginning and, and I did have a process. I actually uh, went to people that I admired already in the space that I knew used VAs and I kind of aggregated their contact list. And then I started there interviewing them. Now I landed on a particular firm in the Philippines um, for a virtual assistant. And uh, initially I just had a series of tasks, right? Like I think I was delegating 10 to 15 hours of work a month. Right. And so that's not enough for a dedicated VA yeah. and that, um, you know, it was, it, it was interesting because, you know, some weeks the work is really high quality other weeks, like, you know, it was, you know, I had to wonder what, where my mess was, right. How was I not delegating? And yeah. so originally, um, it probably, I, I scaled back on what I handed over. Um, but then I quickly, you know, thought that I was like, oh wait, I got to get better directions that way. Anybody can pick this up and do it. Um, so once I kind of had that mindset shift that it, I was the owner of the issue and that I was empowered to correct it, that's when I started seeing a lot of those things iron out. And once you get to that point, then it's amazing. Cause then you want to start, now you understand how to actually create the SFP, the process, which I had, I come, I had to come from an operations background, but it was, um, being able to, you know, delegate across country to other time zones where you're not hundred percent interacting, maybe even have a language barrier, you know, yeah. um, that, that was really where I had a huge learning curve. But once I learned how to do that and, um, delegate and track and manage, um, you know, just as if they were an employee of mine, um, then I, I felt empowered to give over more and more and more. Now, um, the other process, you know, uh, I wasn't afraid to say, you know, kind of raise my hand and say, you know, whoever you have working on this doesn't work. You know, let's find somebody yeah. else. And I think, you know, you, that is where a lot of people kind of get, I think, dissuaded from using virtual assistants is that they don't they don't kind of cut the cord quick enough when things really truly aren't working like if you have checked yourself and made sure your process is airtight then that's just not the right person you know move on go find somebody else and you know that allows you to get better service but also you're cutting the other person on the other end you know loose to where they can go you know you know participate in what they do better. yeah um, so it can be a win-win and I don't think people have, you know, I know, I know, um, you know, I'm in a couple of masterminds where this conversation comes up a lot. I'm like, you got to cut them loose, go find somebody else. Don't worry about them. They'll be okay. They'll land yeah. on their feet. <laughs> 
Um, and then, you know, you know, find ways to, to delegate. Um, I, I, I would say first, you know, cut, like, if, do you have an activity that you just truly shouldn't be doing, you know, cut ruthlessly all those things that shouldn't be doing that don't delegate anything that you shouldn't be doing. And then try to automate as much as you can take advantage, um, you know, of, you know, technology. And then mm -hmm. those things that you can't cut, can't automate. Can you defer it? Do you need to do it even now? Um, if it is a building, building business, business building activity, don't defer it. Um, and then delegate. So I think delegation is actually the last step in all of this. Yeah. I mean, you, uh, you hit the nail on the head with, uh, making sure that you cut that VA. Um, I've had, I've had multiple VAs because here's kind of the, the basis for them is going back to what you just talked about is okay. Well, some of them turned to the point that they, they had 30 rentals slash, you know, 30 VAs. And then they said, I'm going to scale this even higher. So they're picking up VAs that may not be as good, you know, and they're, they're not vetting them, you know, to the point that like, it felt good for them to, you know, um, you know, they sign off, but it doesn't feel like, you know, it's good for you and a good fit. So that person can go off and go do something else, but cut them as soon as you can, if you don't feel like they're a fit for your processes and make sure that, you know, they're in your system properly, because I've had some VAs that have come on and, or, you know, been more of like headhunter situations where they're going to find a VA for you and the VAs don't work out and they're not good for your system. And they're, you know, they may be working on 15 different things and yours is the last priority of that week. And it should have been the first priority ultimately, because you hired them to do that. So, um, I, I think you, you had some, you know, good golden nuggets there because hiring VAs is just like hiring an employee. You really need to weed out the ones that aren't good for your, you know, your system and, and your, you know, company, if your company's small or big, you got to make sure you're weeding out the, you know, that 10, 15% that aren't good, um, and really mold that company to what you want it to be. Yeah. And if they are good, if you find a diamond in the rough or a gem, you know, how can you delegate more? How can you become more of their share of the hours? Right. And that's really how VAs are organized. You know, they're trying to piece together full-time jobs. And of course, if you're delegating 10 hours a week and they all of a sudden something comes across and it's 20, you know, they have to make decisions for themselves and their family as well. So I think it's really, you know, when you find somebody that's great, how can you double down and leverage them even more? Yeah, for sure. I mean, how can you take that person and make them, you know, kind of the headhunter for you and, and take them and put them in your system where you can say, okay, well, Hey, I need three more because obviously, you know, you're getting bogged down with all the work I'm sending. So this is a system, you know, it, so go out and find two or three other ones that you can hire underneath you and delegate that stuff. And then you take the more high le level stuff. So no, that's, that's key for sure to be able to, uh, even have that conversation. A lot of people, like you said, um, just hold on to their VAs or just, you know, write off VAs completely because, you know, they don't feel like it's a fit for their business because they ran into a bad one. Yeah. I mean, you got to break some, got to, what, what, what is the saying? Break a few eggs to make an omelet. So. Yeah. 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 hundred percent. Um, so where did you guys, I'm actually curious because I have a, um, I have a friend that's, um, I think you just bought a car wash, but where'd you guys get, um, the point of, buying car washes and tell me a little bit about that side of the business and investing. Yeah, definitely. So, um, you know, I'm with a private equity group, um, private, uh, passive investing.com. And, um, you know, we'll do, we've specialized in multifamily and that's really where, you know, we, we launched the business. We brought on self storage about a year, almost two years ago. Uh, and then, uh, car washes and hotels. And, you know, with our car wash opportunity, we're looking specifically at express car washes. So not your in-bay DIY car washes where you're dropping the quarters in and you pray your 10-year-old doesn't spray you with the hose. Not yeah. the in-bay automatics, which are like attached to a gas station. And not the full service where you have an army of people vacuuming your car and then it goes through maybe a short little tunnel to get washed. And then, you know, an army of people like wiping it down and drying it. So we're really, and the reason why we're focused on that express tunnel car wash opportunity is because it's the best of both worlds, right? You can get that high touch, clean product with low overhead, um, lower overhead. 
And so you're getting high margins. It's a high margin cash flow opportunity. You can run it with um, you know two to three full time employees. But also car washes in general. I mean, it's a thirty three billion dollar business annually and growing. Um, the whole industry as a whole is growing at three point nine percent. But when you look at the express tunnel, you know, sector, it's growing at um, you know almost double that. But, and it's a very, it's a new business. It's very mm -hmm. fractionalized. There's no third party management. So you have a lot of mom and pop owners mm -hmm. um, that own these properties and only about 15% of those owners actually have five or more locations. And really it's that when you hit five or more locations, now that mom and pop owner can elevate themselves out of being operators and maybe hire a regional manager for those five locations. And so what did it, I hearken it back to self storage in 2006, seven and eight, where um, you, you really have this um, early market consolidation opportunity, um, providing that you can do a couple things. One, that you can solve the third party um, property management opportunity, mm -hmm. um, which we're, you know, building our own third party management uh, company for our, our portfolio that we're developing of 200 or 250 to 300 locations. And two, and I, these are coupled together, is that you stay away from um, opportunities where you don't own the land or the brand. And so, you know, you know, primarily you want to make sure in the entire deal that you own the land the entire operations and that you own the brand. So that kind of knocks out a lot of these franchise opportunities, which is what we're seeing in the environment today. There's a lot of development or excuse me, investment, passive investment opportunities, but they're franchise ground up developments. Now I'm not knocking them, um, but you mm -hmm. just have to understand the risks that come with that. Um, you know, those type of opportunities. You know, do you do you actually own the land? Do you control the profit and loss statement? Do you control the future business opportunity? And then, you know, how insulated are you against other operators within the brand that may not have the exact same standards that you do for your yeah. operation? Yeah, that's that's actually really good. I haven't heard that as um, own the land and the brand. That's um, that's that's good and and a key piece to I would assume making sure that it's the right investment and. Um, you guys, was that something that you guys figured out right away or was that something that you guys really educated yourself on before even buying the first one? Yeah. So we actually started educating ourselves, um, you know, on these opportunities, you know, so we opened up our, we purchased our first deals a little over a year ago okay. and, um, we started, you know, educating ourselves about, you know, almost two years before that. Now, um, we are now considered one of the industry leaders in the space just um, because you learn so much when you have to, when you're scaling a third party management company to take over these assets. So we're not cutting our teeth on one to five locations. We're cutting our teeth on now we have 18 locations and we, by the end of February, I think we'll have gotten up to 25, right? So we're, we're scaling rapidly. Um, we're looking to add another 100 locations under our belt this year. Um, we're also developing as well, um, you know, in order to hit that 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 unit count. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's such an amazing opportunity. It really what it is, is it's a business. I think this is what a lot of investors don't fully have their head wrapped around. You know, you know, most investors, especially passive investors, are looking for yield. They're chasing yield. Mm -hmm. um, and I know investors are very frustrated right now by the interest rate environment and they're not able to get that yield so much uh, in single family properties, uh, maybe a little bit, you know, I, I've seen a lot of people exit out of single families and go to midterm rentals and short term rentals in order to hit that yield opportunity. They're a little disenchanted with multifamily right now. Um, they're, they're looking at self storage expansion deals to maybe pump up the yield a little bit. Car wash is an operating business, cash flowing business. You know, we can move it from individual customer pay to an MM monthly recurring revenue model. Um, you know, so really stabilize the income and the asset. We can accelerate the growth of the income and the asset. Um, you know, but it throws off some really nice cash flow opportunities. But it is a business that has real estate as a component of it. So when you look at how the cash flow is brought in, it's business driven, right? There's not a year long contract. There's a month to month subscription fee, right? So yeah. there's a little bit more volatility in the environment. 
Um, you know, most of the people wash their cars, you know, between March and October, you know, winter months are a little more sleepy, right? Yeah. So there's a little bit more, um, I wouldn't say you know, a little bit more volatility, I, I would say, you know, um, market forces that are playing in here. But yeah. here's the thing, most Americans have a car and they wash their car 13 times a year. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, I would say um, subscription fee all, you know, that would probably even put the the numbers even better for, you know, when you go sell it down the line um, or when you're buying it, right? Like um, you could see, you know, you can see that with obviously rents of a multifamily, but subscription, you could say, okay, well, there's, you know, 300, 400 people that use this car wash, but in reality, this market shouldn't be yielding at least five to 600 people. And you could see that there's meat on the bone for, you know, investors and yourself when you look at that, you know, look at that, um, that property to buy and develop on or, and, or, you know, buy that's a already existing business. Um, what for you guys, since you guys have that lofty goal for um, what you guys are going to add development in, how long does it take to to find the land and and buy it, build it and get all the permits and stuff like that? What do, what do you kind of see the runway there? Well, on the development side, um, on the, the two that, you know, are currently being developed, uh, I wasn't so much involved in the acquisition side of this of that business. However, um, you know, just kind of high level brushstrokes. Uh, when we actually put that deal out to our investors, we actually had the permitting um, like 90% of the way there. It, would, it was going to be done before we closed. We had started that about six months prior. Um, the land was already locked up and under contract. Um, development wise, you know, we're targeting 18 months. Okay. Um, you know, we'll underwrite the pro forma to two years, but we're actually, um, you know, realistically can get it done in 12 okay. months and that's providing that all the um you know everything you know the timelines are held and you know you know we've you know gave ourselves some conservative cushion there mm -hmm. um so you know development wise 12 months we tell our investors you know you know we're looking at 18 give ourselves about six months but underwriting they're seeing 24 um, you know, but we, we under promise over deliver, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and when you guys are looking at those, um, car washes, are you guys, uh, looking in any state or is there a specific state you guys have pinpointed? Yeah. So we, right now, you know, the, our focus is in like the Carolinas, um, you know, the East coast, you know, up okay. to, you know, into like, you know, Virginia down to Florida. Um, you know, maybe a little bit more inland to like, you know, um, Tennessee and Georgia. Um, okay. Not that Georgia is necessarily inland. I do, yeah. It does touch the coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah I got gotcha. <laughs> you. Pass, I did pass their gate geography there. <laughs> yeah, you just mean inland from East Coast. I get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. There, there's more land inland. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but okay. anyway, long story short, um, we're focused there because, you know, for two reasons. One, you know, our our you know, majority of our team is there and our, um, pro you know, property management company, we wanted to keep things very centralized. Um, as we started to grow the, um, both the acquisition side of the business, the operational side of the business, as well as the, de um, development side of the business, you know, you don't want to be figuring out these issues, you know, five times, three time zones away. Yeah. Right. And you want you want to have your team right there to where you know any one of our founders can, you know, be to any one of our locations in like a matter of hours to, you know, help troubleshoot what was going on mm -hmm. or any one of our managing partners, I should say. And so uh, that was the reason why we did that. Do we do we expect to expand from there? Absolutely. But when you're kind of cutting your teeth. Um, I think it's it's kind of nice to keep things kind of core and tight, and then you can, you know, expand as, as rapidly as you want from there once you have your processes figured out. Yeah, for sure. I mean, at least you guys have that um, avatar for you know where you're looking and what you're looking at to to purchase that property, um, and then moving forward, you know, being able to make sure that it fits all the you know, you dot all the I's, cross all the T's, um, and then. And then looking at another business model, you guys are talking about um, and have been investing in hotels. Yeah, we have 153 keys in Hilton Head. So it was a Holiday Inn Express 
um, you know, an amazing opportunity. We're always looking for more hotels. Um, but, you know, we saw the opportunity. Actually, we, we were set to um, launch our first hotel in April of 2020. Oh, okay. Not and the time. That, that wasn't a good time. <laughs> that was not a good time. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, uh, I, w- I wasn't on this side of the business. Um, you know, I was still on the, the, the co-GP side of the business at that point in time. But, you know, um, you know, stepped away from that. But we'd already been, um, you know, setting up all of our, our systems and our teams with Aileron Hotel Management. Um, you know, uh, we worked very closely with hotel consultants for, you know, almost two years before putting together that initial deal. And we stayed in very close contact with them after. And there is a unique opportunity. Um, you know, you know, most people think hotels really got raked over the coals during COVID. Mm-hmm. Yes and no. Um, if you can remove out the larger full service um, entities, you know, like your wedding venues and your conference centers, um, you know, you're left with, you know, leisure driven hotels. Um, And then you're left kind of like with your budget hotels, right? And then your extended stays. And it's really that, that, you know, we're looking specifically with that leisure driven opportunity that has a corporate overlay that hasn't fully come back. And Mm. that kind of gives the best of both worlds, right? We, you know, there was a slight disruption there, you know, um, and there's a little bit of a devaluation there, but not as much as one would think. but anyways, they also did really well during COVID because, you know, while people, you know, were canceling conferences and their weddings, uh, they were traveling. A lot of people were traveling within 300 miles of, you know, where they live and guess where they were staying. They weren't, they were staying either, you know, they were staying in hotels, you know, Airbnb industry also took off at that point in time, you know, gather a few friends that you know, love and trust and stay with them. But um, you know, we didn't see a high amount of disruption in that space. Yeah. I, I mean, I've talked to multiple Airbnb owners cause I'm pretty close to one really big Airbnb area and, um, they've 20, you know, highs and lows 2021 was great. And then now, you know, they're in a different market where, you know, it's not as prevalent to get a, you know, visitor in to actually stay the full weekend or week. Um, and they really experienced that in 2021 at the height. So what have you guys seen on your side for hotel wise, um, residents and, you know, people coming in to stay for the weekend and stuff like that? Has that gone down the past six months because of, you know, other economic factors like inflation and everything else? No, actually, we've seen quite the opposite. I mean, it's in Hilton Head. It's in a beach location. Um, you know, you ha- you can have branded or unbranded hotel chains. Um, our, ours, we renegotiated the brand uh, on that um, particular property. Holiday Inn, it was a Holiday Inn Express. And we just, you know, were able to renegotiate and renew that brand. They really wanted to stay on the island. We really wanted to remain a Holiday Inn Express. Um, so that brings a lot of notoriety and, you know, a lot of people are very loyal to their hotel brands. Sure. Um, you know, some people I know that they were like, Marriott or bust. I'm not staying yeah. anywhere else. I understand who they are, you know, holiday in or bust. I'm not going anywhere else. And so that was, you know, being the only one on the Island that was, you know, something that was very, um, you know, uh, very important for us to continue to, to, you know, own that brand there or license that brand. Um, also, you know, with Hilton Head, you know, conferences have started coming back, you know, shorter conferences, three or four day conferences have started to come back and, you know, our, our property is being utilized for that as well. Yeah. I've, I've actually never heard of Hilton Head and then you started talking about it. So I pulled it up it looks pretty nice. Um, I've, uh, it is a, yeah, I, it uh, is a Southern Mecca. <laughs> oh, is it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've never, um, never heard of it. So I pulled it up on the map and I was looking at it as you were just talking about, you know, um, all the, the ins and outs of being, you know, in the hotel business and making sure that, you know, you have, you know, that brand, but yeah, it's a nice area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have the leisure travel component and, you know, think about it, um, you know, for people, um, you know, will, will, you know, inflation impact just, you know, that a little bit. Yes. And no. Right. Like um, your your local drives that are about 300 miles away, the, those type of vacations, regional vacations aren't getting detoured that much. Now, what you do have is seasonality in you know, that particular area. Um, this 
you know, the off season is way shorter than, you know, a lot of beach communities. Um, you know, that is something to kind of pay attention to, but, um, you know, we've got, you know, several different leads into generating income on that property. Yeah, no, it's, um, you know, at least you have that funnel that's going into, you know, one small place and, and also, you know, having it kind of, uh, you know, monopolized in that little small area versus going, you know, to a bigger area like San Diego or, you know, um, San Francisco or something like that, where someone could stay it in a ton of different places. You really have it funneled in there. So that's cool. Um, well, so we'll transition to the last couple of questions. Um, but before we do, I just want to see kind of what, what are your thoughts going forward for 2023, 2024 for, you know, your investments and, you know, moving forward with passiveinvesting.com. Yeah. So, you know, we're continuing to invest. There's money to be made in all cycles. I think um, really, you know, this would be a, you know, um, kind of tips for anybody, you know, just making sure that any asset you go into has multiple pillars of wealth building, you know, capital preservation, cash flow, equity growth, um, tax benefits, smart use of leverage, super important right now. This is not the time to get into any uncapped adjustable rate mortgages with zero extensions making sure that mortgage situation, that lending situation is very buttoned up and making sure you're an asset that, you know, has high quality demographic metrics associated with it that, you know, multiple drivers in that market, multiple drivers to the income of that property. Very important right now. I think, you know, that alone can help stabilize anybody's asset, you know, so that that's really the rules of thumb that, you know, we're continuing to build our personal portfolio with. As far as like what we're doing at PassiveInvesting.com, um, you know, we're sticking with our same conservative um, underwriting. I know everybody says that, right? But you know, there's a difference between saying it and actually doing it. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we're if it means that we have fewer deals coming on the market or opportunity for invest, but you know, the assets that do come up for investment are smarter mm-hmm. to invest in. That's a win. Yeah. Um, we also see the opportunity, you know, self storage. There's a wonderful opportunities. Car washes. There's wonderful opportunities. I think there will be plenty of those in 2023. Um, multifamily deals. I expect some slower growth in those opportunities. Um, however, but if you think about it, a lot of operators got themselves into adjustable rate mortgages, mm-hmm. and maybe didn't have a cap on their cap rate, and they're getting raked over the coals. I think there's going to be a lot of pressure for for operators to exit those assets as that um, that rate adjusts, either the cap disappears after three years or the rate's just been adjusting on them you know, drastically. Um, I think in you know, Q3, Q4, and the Q1 2021, 2024, mm-hmm. I think there's gonna be some buying opportunities. Um, you know, yeah. For- yeah, I even think in a, you know, 24 and 25, I think there'll be, you know, quite a bit, kind of like what you just talked about, not having that cap. And then also, you know, um, even people that have, you know, we're going to sell and they were going to sell to an operator that had a, um, interest only loan. Those people had to pull out. So they got to sell at some point if they didn't find another buyer for it. So that's another opportunity, you know, lying in the weeds, especially with, uh, with people that are looking for multifamily deals. I think that that's going to happen a lot too. Yeah. I mean, um, I listen to all, all sorts of, you know, um, you know, economists about where, you know, reading the tea leaves, looking into the crystal ball of what's going to happen. I think one thing that's really sitting for me right now is that, you know, we always, we all always knew that the the music was going to stop or slow down yeah. tremendously. But we, I think everybody was really kind of banking on that recession to be five to six years out. I think just everything that happened with COVID and runaway inflation um and with the interest rates that just accelerated it to come here so i'm really excited you know for what happens once we kind of make it through in the next you know few months to a year 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 and a half for sure yeah i agree i think um you know the next year and a half will be interesting especially for the real estate market on the single family side and multifamily and or you know investment commercial side so um well Hey, Whitney, we'll, we'll transition. So one thing um, I always ask my guests, is there some type, you've talked about systems a lot in this interview, but is there one online resource and or app that's helped your business today be more efficient? Oh my gosh. Um, personally, um, I use Asana, but I, 
um, that is kind of where I have everything housed. I think it's sort of the process that leads into that that is probably the most impactful. And is that personally, my husband and I sit down and we do a goal setting retreat annually every year. And we'll ask the same questions every single year and get different answers of what we want to do, how we want to grow, what, you know, where do we want to, um, you know, you know, take our family and, you know, next. Um, and just keeping all those tracked and delegating notes. And there's just so much that we want to do. I can't possibly all keep it in my head. But um, so we do that. And then we have a weekly money meeting. Um, and it can be just as silly as like, what camps are our daughter going through? <laughs> going to yeah. like, do you have her for day? Do you have her for day? But also like, you know, keeping those goals that we actually said that we wanted to do over 2023 and getting them done. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, we front load that work. Um, we've been front loading a lot of that work. You know, we did our meeting in November, December. We front loaded a lot of the work that we were off the, you know, off to the races for 2023. We didn't wait until after the holidays to get that done. Mm -hmm. um, professionally, uh, you know, um, passiveinvesting.com, you know, we're really, you know, investing in our communications and um, how we communicate internally, but also with like our investors. And I think, you know, we'll start seeing uh, more and more of our communications move through HubSpot. And that just allows us to be able to kind of target and track, um, which sounds like all oh, like marketing terms, but you know, from a, a, a investor services perspective that can be very powerful as well. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you instill confidence with, with those investors too. you know, making sure that you're on point and on brand, you know, kind of going back to your brand. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. And so any books that you can recommend that you've read in the past or recently that's helped you out? Um, one of my favorite that I always point people back to is the one thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. I, I read it every year. And every time I read it, I pull out something. It's like staring you black and white in the face. And then you're like, you read it. I'm like, I'm the sixth time reading it. I'm like, how did I miss that? <laughs> I just yeah, don't understand. Yeah. Or like, it finally clicks. You're ready to accept what they were trying to say, right? They're so far in creating such a elegantly simple yet powerful process. You're like, oh, that's what they meant by that. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, that book. Um, and then I'm really focused on my personal health. Um, you know, I always have been, but even like, you know, um, moving into my later years as a woman, um, there's a book um, out there called Fast Like a Girl. And I don't mean like running fast. I mean, like learning about just, you know, what foods fuel like your body and your hormones and um, again, elegantly simple, elegantly simple, but super powerful. Yeah. Good, good, good. Um, no, this is, uh, this is good, especially, you know, the one thing, um, I feel like, uh, you know, people always kind of talk about, um, and I think that that's one, you know, that's not up there on the, on the huge bestseller book, but there's a lot of people that read it and a lot of people that take a lot of value at it, like, like yourself. So, um, well, before we get out of here, where can people find out more about you? Sure. Absolutely. Um, if you want to reach out to me directly, you can do so at PassiveInvestingWithWhitney.com. It's a subpage on the PassiveInvesting.com website. Um, but only there will you get some free goodies in my ebook on how to get started as a passive investor. And, and that's the only place you'll get access to my calendar if you want to talk about anything real estate and see our open deals. Well, awesome, Whitney. That's that's perfect. We'll put that in the show notes too, so people can go there. Um, I appreciate your time today and actually going through step by step how, some of these processes to get to where you're at today. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. It's been so fun. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Have a great day. You too.